Um, first of all, I'd like to welcome you all here. My name is Alexander Verhalen, and I'm the recruiting partner for Drones Day here in Brussels. So I'm, you know, of everything that here tonight, I'm the least important person. Uh, uh, and you see, actually, we are uh, in small print on the screen. So, uh, but, but this being said, I think this is a great opportunity for you to get exposed to what it means to do an LLM. I can tell you that if your goal is to uh, practice in an international environment, uh, have, having done an LLM is a basic prerequisite. And, and evening like today are, are, are uh, fantastic opportunities for you to get informed about um, which university to pick and how to get admitted. I mean, these are two important points. Um, and, and I wish you a, 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 very, a, a very informative evening tonight. Now, without any further ado, I will now pass the, the mic to the most, to the more important persons than, than myself. So and enjoy tonight, and we're very happy to host this. And thank you very much. We give a round of applause to Jones Day. In fact, uh, Jones Day is the most important part here because we wouldn't be here without them. So thank you so much to all of you for coming tonight. My name is Erica Lutz. I'm the Executive Director of the Fulbright Commission. We sit around the corner in the Coninier Bibliothèque in the Bibliothèque Royale, uh, here just a few meters away. And we run the Fulbright office, so giving out scholarships, which you will hear more about from my colleague Nathan in a little bit. And you will also uh, hear about Education USA. So we run the Education USA office here in Brussels. To explain more about that, we have the head of Education USA Europe here with us tonight from Istanbul. So I will pass the phone over to uh, Chris. Thank you very much, Erica. My name is Christopher Medalis, and I'm the regional director for Education USA. And Education USA is a program of the US State Department. And what we do is provide free, accurate, comprehensive, and current information about the full range of U.S. universities. Basically, we're the information service for students to find out about study in the U.S. Now, we also are proud to assist U.S. universities <coughs> who would like to come and visit potential students and inform them about such opportunities. So that's why we've organized this LLM tour with our local partners, the Fulbright Commission, uh, and you'll learn more about what they do and how they can assist you to apply. So I would just like to encourage you to speak with all of the U.S. University representatives who have come here to Belgium tonight because they are very interested and would welcome you on their campuses. So if you decide to the U.S., go to the U.S. to study, we think that would be great. If you don't, that's also great, and we wish you a lot of luck with your future education and career, wherever it may be. We're all global citizens at this point, and we all need to understand each other better and work with each other better. So we believe whatever kind of education and whatever kind of international experience you have is great. So good luck and all the best. Thank you. So we are just... <laughs> To explain our mission one more time, since I know it's very confusing when you see us on the website as Commission for Educational Exchange, uh, you see on the one hand the Educational Advising Center, so you can call, you can email us, we do free outreach like we're doing tonight, and on the other side we're also giving out scholarships to go to the United States, so people in our domain are Belgian citizens, <coughs> Luxembourg citizens, and people of the EU, so the 28 EU member states. If you are not part of this group, do not worry. There are Fulbright commissions in nearly 150 countries in the world. So this evening we have a fantastic lineup for you. Um, in fact, this is, I've been working here for six years, this is the most, the highest number of US LLM representatives that is congregated in Belgium that I know of uh, for at least the last 10 years that I've spoken to various sources, so that's a fantastic achievement. The fact that they would like to come here to Brussels to talk to all of you says a lot about all of you, as well as the interest in going to the U.S. Um, there's nearly 150 different LLM programs out there, and so we have chosen four different universities and different locations to talk to you about different parts of the process. Um, Sylvia, my colleague from uh, Columbia Law School, will be talking a little bit about the LLM process overall. We will hear um, from Curry, 
on the University of Minnesota to talk about things that you should think about when you're selecting an LLM program or selecting to do an LLM in general. Uh, my colleague Jennifer from Duke will be talking about the nuts and bolts of the application process because that is very different than that of a generic uh, European university. And then finally, we will also have Polly from UVA talking about uh, the LLM and the bar exam. The bar has become a bit different over the years and it's a bit more complicated and challenging to wrestle with whether or not you should take it. Um, and then finally, we have my colleague Nathan talking about some funding opportunities as well as some special partnerships that we have for law. Um, I, without further ado, would like to, they're all in a row, so this is perfect. I will pass the microphone to Sylvia. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I also want to thank um, all of you for coming tonight. Uh, thank the organizer and Jones Day for having us. Can we just get an idea of who's uh, in the room? Do, do I need this? Can you guys hear me without it? Yes. yes? Okay, good. Thank you. Um, who is in the process of applying to start the LLM in the fall of 2016? Hands up. Okay. Um, fall of 2017. Okay. And beyond just sort of starting your investigation, who's in that category? Good. Well, welcome um, to all of you. Speaking about the LLM program is one of the, my uh, favorite topics, so I'm uh, really thrilled to have been asked to, to do this tonight. Um, the fact that you're here says to, to all of us that you've already done some of the very basic research, so I don't think we have to start at a, a sort of the first step. Um, let me just start by saying that the LLM year is really a transformative year. It is a year that will change you professionally, it's a year that will change you academically and personally. The opportunity to step away from, you know, there are people back there, I'm sorry I can't make eye contact with everybody. Um, the opportunity to step away from home and spend a year um, thinking about law in whatever way you want to think about law is wonderful. Um, to spend an entire year just studying um, with students from all over the world, regardless of where you end up, you will end up with a lot of international students and with JD students. Um, it is really important that as students you really engage in the life of the law school. The LLM will sort of encompass your whole life. It is studying, it is making friends, it is getting to know the city where you're living. So go prepare to just embrace the entire experience. Um, studying law in the US is different perhaps than it has been for many of you here. I like to say to my LLMs that we law schools in the US are not set up to teach you what the law is. Um, that's not what we're about. Are you going to learn what the law is? Of course you are. But we are much more interested in helping you develop your analytical skills, your critical thinking skills, and we do that by the way we teach law, the way you participate in class. You do readings before class, you're in class, and you're going to get called on by professors, and you're going to answer, and you might, in class, end up having to debate each other. And sometimes you walk out of class not really sure what they, knowing what the answer is, the answer to whatever the question was. Sometimes you don't even know what the question is. Um, but the idea is to get you thinking critically, thinking about what factors um, uh, impact the development of laws. What historical factors, what cultural factors, what political factors, what factors in general. And how do you, as current or future lawyers, impact the development of law? And as you read cases is, why did this case, for example, end up in, in the court? What could the parties have done differently to avoid this? Or what should the law be to make sure that in the future these cases don't end up in court? And that's what you're going to be doing. Are you going to learn law along the way? Of course you're going to learn law. Um, but you're not going to have classes where a professor sits here with an outline with the black letter law and say, okay, in order to have a contract, you have to have these four elements, and we're going to memorize that. Excuse me. So an important part of this is making sure that you're ready to go and engage in that learning process. Don't be a passive learner. Do your readings, participate in class, challenge yourself um, to be an active participant. Another big part of the LLM program is um, your network. You are going to make some lifelong friends. You're going to make a lot of really good friends. You're going to make lifelong business associates. Um, you may go 10 years without seeing your classmates, and all of a sudden you have a matter where you need somebody from Turkey, and you're going to remember that Turkish uh, classmate that you had, and you're going to connect, and it's going to be as if time had not passed. But an important part of that uh, network is also the JD students. Wherever you go, it's really important that you get to know the JD students. After all, you're there in part to become more familiar with US legal culture. So make sure that you get to know them. Get involved with student groups. There are some chairs up here if you'd like to come up here. Come on up, it's okay. Um, get involved with student groups. Every one of our universities has 
tens of student groups. Some of them might be um, organized by uh, subject area, maybe a group that studies constitutional law. It might be a political group. It might be a purely social group. Get involved. It's a great way to get to know students, other students, JDs, other LLMs, and just to understand sort of the life of the law school a little bit um, better. I would urge you to really get um, connected with your community. It's really easy with the internet to just continue reading the newspapers from home, and that's great. But find a local newspaper or a U.S. newspaper and read it while you're there. Know what's going on, especially those of you who are going to be there in the fall as we're near the elections, which is going to be consuming a lot of our attention. It's really nice when you're involved to know what's, what's going on. But get involved in your community also by doing pro bono. Pro bono is such an important part of, of U.S. law school life. Um, and it's, it's a different way to get involved in your small community or a bigger community. And every one of our schools will have lots of opportunities for you to do that. So I think my message is, is to engage because that's how you make the year really good. Get to know your faculty. Um, this may not be the case at your universities, but our faculty members are full-time faculty, not all, we all have adjuncts, who are there to work with the students, become a research assistant, a teaching assistant, um, go to their office hours, get to know them. And by the same means, get to know some of the administrators also. Uh, these are people who will, in one way or another, be in your lives uh, for a long time. Um, as you get ready, uh, you know, Marie is going to talk a lot about what to, what to look for when you're planning um, where you're going to go for the LM. But one thing I would encourage you is to find as many people as you can who have done LMs and ask them questions. Find out how they chose their LMs, why, what they liked and what they didn't. Um, because there are a lot of really, really good programs um, in the U.S. So you want to make sure that you find the one that's right for you. The other thing that I think is really important is that we all, you know, we come to these sessions and we talk to you about all the great benefits to you of doing an LLM. And yes, there are lots of great benefits. But the truth is that there's a benefit to us, to having you all, which is that you really, really enrich the law school, the life of where, whatever law school you go to. You have very different experiences, different perspectives. So make sure that you give that back. Make sure that we are also learning from you. Um, and that is, of course, by getting involved in class discussion, as I've mentioned, in, in events, and planning events um, that help us learn from uh, your experiences. Let me take a look, make sure I haven't forgotten anything really important. Um, you know, it's, a, it's also a great opportunity to study new areas of law. Uh, you might be a corporate lawyer and, and you're, you're going to spend the rest of your life doing corporate law, but take advantage and try something different. You never know when you will find a new passion. Um, all of our schools will have lots of uh, one-off lectures at lunchtime or in the evening, and there might be speakers who aren't necessarily in your area of law, but it sounds like it might be interesting. Go see. Go hear them. You never know when you'll discover um, a new passion. The other thing I say about the LLM is it'll make the world a much smaller place for you, and I say that in a very good way. You will find yourself in places running into classmates um, that you never expected. You will never travel the same because there will be somebody um, in your country who is an alum of your uh, school who will be happy to give you hints about where to go, and you will never have gone to as many weddings as you will after you've uh, made uh, some of them with yours, maybe even a wedding to a classmate, but it really is a lifelong experience. I uh, commend all of you for at least considering it, and I wish you good luck, and, and really take advantage of tonight to ask. There'll be a time for uh, questions and answers here with all of us, but go and talk to all the different schools. There are a lot of different types of schools represented, and you can learn something from all of them. So thank you for coming. Good evening. Uh, again, my name is Kari Hornsby, and uh, it's my great pleasure to be here from the University of Minnesota. Uh, I believe I'm the, uh, the northernmost representative uh, from the U.S. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with Minnesota, um, simply just put your finger in the middle of the U.S. map and go north. If you hit Canada, you've gone a bit too far, but just barely, where, where our northern border is Canada. But, um, uh, so if you like snow, so definitely come talk to me. Uh, I have the pleasure of, of being here to present to you um, some, some factors to consider uh, when selecting an LLM program. So we'll go through some of these. Um, I'll begin a bit, uh, I have a slide, but I'll begin a bit um, by, by stating uh, the first factor to consider is actually a, a very reflective one. Uh, it, it's one... Uh, that is uh, very personal, um, and I think uh, it's one that is very helpful for you if you ask it at the very beginning of the process. 
Um, as Dean Paul mentioned, there are a lot of LLM programs in the U.S. Uh, if you kind of just sit down um, at a computer and say, all right, let's, let's start LLM programs in the U.S. Again, as Erica suggested, there are over 150. Uh, you will be overwhelmed. <clears throat> all the LLM programs have their strengths, um, and they all have their weaknesses relative to, to, to your wants and your needs. Um, so the best way um, to, when you're, when, you're, when you're considering an LLM program, the best thing to do is start that process in earnest with an idea of, of what you want, of, of what your needs are. Um, and I, 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 a lot of times we notice applicants have this, have this desire to come up with like the, 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 the perfect reason, right? As if we're looking for, for the, 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 there's, a, there's a right answer to want to pursue an LLM program. We're going to, when we review your applications, um, I, won't, I won't touch application review much because my colleague from Duke is going to touch on that. But as if we're looking for the, your perfect motivation. And, and that's not the case. Um, we're looking for you. Uh, and the, the better you're aware of your own needs, your own desires, um, um, your aspirations, the better you can articulate that to yourself, the better you can to us. And that process can, can, be, can be much more efficient for you um, as, as you proceed. Um, some of the, the overarching themes we see in terms of students' motivations uh, for pursuing an LLM are um, about, you know, uh, uh, elevating your, your value to employers, right? It's, it's a career move. It's something to um, separate yourself from peers, from colleagues, from classmates. Um, it, it, it's obviously a very valuable degree, and for some, for some countries even, you need to have an LLM to reach certain uh, professional, uh, reach a certain professional status for example, a judge, et cetera. Um, to deepen your specialty in a certain field, um, that's a very common uh, motivation. Or, as opposed to that, to switch fields. Perhaps uh, you want to change the trajectory of your career. And uh, as opposed to simply telling an employer, well, I'm very interested in this, um, you can present a, uh, a degree and say, not only am I interested in it, but I've invested time um, to, 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 to uh, become an expert or begin a mastery. Uh, in this area. Uh, it was suggested networking. Um, this may not be um, a motivation that perhaps is uh, in, in, in your up, the upper tier of your priorities right now, but we find oftentimes when speaking to our alumni that that is actually the thing they, they, they value, they come to value the most. Um, uh, to your point, I was speaking to an uh, alum in Amsterdam, and he said, uh, yesterday actually, and he said that um, his favorite part of this element of experience is that he can travel around the world and never have to buy a hotel room. Um, he just, you know, knocks, you know, lets class, former classmates know he's on his way, and they give him a couch or a bed. Um, but this is a very, um, in some ways, it's a very short experience, right? It's only nine months long. Um, and as was, suggest as was suggested, it's a very concentrated nine months. It's, it's not nine months of you meandering about. It's, it's your, um, you're working. Uh, and only a very few people will be able to really understand and empathize with what, you're, what you'll be going through. I mean, even, even we, as much as um, uh, you know, we are involved with you. Um, you know, each class has its own personalities. Things, you have your own relationships, and of course we, um, uh, we, we are not aware of or, or, or become involved in. And so no one is going to be able to relate to that nine month experience that you'll have, nine month to a year, um, like your classmates. So it's a very in intensive bonding um, experience. And so even though you're only um, with these folks for nine months to a year, you end up, they end up being the people you, you speak to the most. Um, you know, your, your friends, your, your partners, your parents, um, they, they will want to understand, they'll want to support you. You know, you will, of course, speak to them and keep them updated. Um, but oftentimes students say, you know, there's, there's just no words I can find to make them get like this, this place that I'm in for this year, um, you know, both you know, literally and, and existentially, really. Um, so 
So you will have a have a network. You will have a uh, a bond that that will that will last and transcend that experience. Um, first hand exposure to to U.S. law, to common law, but in addition to that, a, a deeper understanding of your own law. Uh, of course, I think it's fairly, uh, fairly intuitive that one would expect to learn more about U.S. law and common law when studying in the U.S. Um, as, was suggested, as was suggested, you have a very active classroom, a very engaged classroom, You'll be asked questions, and most of the answers will be, it depends, <laughs> right? So you're going to get a lot of questions and not necessarily leave with answers, but hopefully leave with a set of skills that will allow you to better evaluate questions. Uh, because the law represents our world. It's dynamic. Uh, and it changes. And uh, therefore, uh, a fixed way of thinking and approaching the law um, really limits one. And so, what I think perhaps counterintuitive, counterintuitively is the fact that you come away with a deeper understanding of your own law. Um, it's just like anything in life, right? If you're, if you're in a situation where you, it's just, this is the way it's been. You were raised here. You were um, raised with certain cultural norms. Um, certain legal norms, things that you just um, you learned about and you questioned, but even the even the spectrum along which you know uh, liberalism and conservatism lies in certain areas is still uniquely cultural. All right, what's a what's a you know a, a liberal way of thinking in, in, in the U.S. is in some European countries very uh, very middle of the road. So it really depends upon the context which you're approaching something as to how nuanced your your thinking is. Um, and so when you come and you have this experience um, and you're engaging in a different legal system, uh, oftentimes it makes you think, huh, it makes you reevaluate those presumptions you may have had about your own legal system that you never questioned because you always interacted with your own legal system. Um, so even if you, you know, leave the, the states and you never represent a U.S. client or you uh, never have the opportunity to work for a a U.S. employer, work in the U.S., work for a U.S.-based employer, that thinking, that, that experience, uh, will still go a long way uh, to, to assist you in your, in your domestic practice. Uh, the bar exam is, is, is another reason. Um, as, as most of you, I'm sure, know, um, uh, the qualification to become a lawyer is controlled in each, individually in each of our 50 states. Uh, and so, um, I think currently there are 30 plus states that allow LLM holders, um, um, U.S. LLM holders with a degree from a, from a foreign country to sit and qualify for the bar under certain <coughs> circumstances. Each state differs a bit, but the, 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 more, the, the more popular <coughs> states are uh, probably New York, California, and I believe uh, D.C. And, 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 and Texas are gaining in popularity. But uh, that's, that's anecdotal. Um, but uh, definitely New York and, and, and California. So that, that qualification uh, is, is, is a very efficient use of a year. Uh, you know, you start your, you start your courses, uh, you complete your degree within nine or ten months, uh, and then you, uh, it's, you're, it's, potentially you can sit for a bar and a bar exam in late July, and then you would go home at the, at, after that point. So it's possible in a calendar year for you to earn a degree and um, you won't have your results from the bar exam back yet, but to at least have taken the bar exam. So for some folks, it's, it's an incredibly efficient use of a year, um, especially um, um, in, in professional, for professional considerations. And last but not least, when you're considering factors, one we hear is a very honest one, and that's that it's my last chance, right? The, 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 the real world is coming, you know, you'll begin your legal practice, you'll, um, you'll start your career, and the opportunity to leave the country, you know, for, you know, for, for longer than a vacation, um, and really have an in-depth experience in another culture, 
you know, that it, it tends to become more and more rare as time progresses, as responsibilities increase. And so a lot of times students say, hey, you know, I'm, of course I'm interested in the, in the degree, um, uh, I'm interested in gaining the, the specializations, but really I just, I really, for cultural purposes and to increase my own, you know, global perspective, I just want, I just want to leave. I want, I want to study in another country. That's valid too. That's valid too. Uh, one thing, um, and, 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 and I'll, I'll adhere a bit more to my, to my slide here uh, at this point. Um, this all goes to the point of right, doing your homework. And doing your homework, starting with, with again, that, that reflective piece of it. In terms of program focus, uh, you know, once you answer that question, that's when you'll be able, that's when that list of 150 programs will really shrink. You know, if you're adamant about studying tax law and you want a school that has a, a, you know, a renowned tax law program, you know, that 150, you know, element program list is going to shrink drastically. <laughs> Human rights, you know, uh, uh, certain different, certain legal practices, etc. So that's why it's so important to really know what you want. Um, in terms of program focus, Understand the difference between a theoretical classroom focus versus a practical focus. Um, many, many schools offer, you know, most schools have a, a vast array of classes. Um, you know, the, you know, if you're interested in human rights, um, I'm, I'm, you'll prob probably be able to take a series of human rights courses at the vast majority of law schools around the U.S. However, if you want to be in a human rights environment or have a, 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 be at a school that has you know, very practical opportunities to work with uh, human rights organizations, NGOs, etc., well, then that's going to change your calculation. Um, it's, it's, you can hire a human rights professor. You cannot um, put yourself in a community uh, that, that's active with NGOs and human rights organizations. So understand when you're evaluating programs, it, that may not matter for you. That may not matter, but again, it's a question. It's, it's a factor in considering uh, programs. Uh, the uh, certain other you know fields, business, etc., are very network based. Entertainment law. We've heard you know had a series of conversations with students uh, um, um, in previous cities about art law and things such as that. These are these are practice areas where um, it's great to be have firm a firm theoretical base. But in business law, no one's going to pay you to think about business. They want answers, preferably yesterday. Uh, and and not you know if, if you if you if you tell the client in business law perspective, well, it depends. Then you're not going to get a great reaction from the client. They want answers, and so um, bridging that gap between theory and practice for certain areas is going to be very important to you. You want to make sure that. Um, if, if, that's, if that is important, that you're at a school that can support that. Um, career advising, student services. Um, again, this is an area where we see a lot of variety. Um, there are many approaches to student services, career services. Some law schools have a dedicated career um, services person who works, <laughs> or, or people who work with LLM students specifically. Some you will share, um, the, 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 the career center will share uh, responsibility for JDs and LLM students. Some, it'll just be one person who might be a, the, the, he or she might run a one person LLM office and that person just wears multiple hats. Um, there's not necessarily a right or wrong way. Just be, just ensure that you're prepared and you're aware of the way that the school approaches that. Because again, um, regardless of your reasons for uh, pursuing the LLM, um, you want to make sure that uh, you're, you're receiving advising, counseling, support. Support is key. Uh, you know, in, in many ways, um, and I think we all share this, um, some, you know, we, we are, again, we sit on admission committees, we make scholarship decisions, but we are also sometimes your friends, your, 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 your confidants, there are things that are going on in your life in this new country where it just helps to have someone to sit down with and say, look, this is what I'm going through, this is what I'm experiencing, 
is this normal? Um, you know, should I be you know, doing something else, thinking about something else? And sometimes they're tied to, to coursework, sometimes they're completely detached from coursework. Um, but you want to feel like you have that support uh, um, wherever you go. Uh, student experience, class size, class interactions. Um, Dean Polo spoke a little bit to um, the, you know, going to office hours, engaging with, the, with, with your classmates, engaging with professors. At some schools, that's a heck of a lot easier than others. Um, be aware of that. Uh, if you, if, 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 if some schools, you, you have these profiles of these wonderful, wonderful faculty who are doing these, this magnificent research, groundbreaking things, you'll never see them. That's just a fact. Some schools, you will never see that person. You will never sit in their class. Speak to students, speak to alums, understand that. That's not a problem, necessarily. There are, like I said, every school has redeeming factors. However, if you're going to that school expecting to study with Professor X or Y, and he or she does not allow LLMs in their class, that's something you need to know now, not when you arrive at the school's doorstep. And that has a lot to do with that engagement portion of that. Uh, and then, and then setting. Uh, you know, you, uh, there's a variety of settings in the U.S. Urban, rural, college, college towns, if, if you will. Um, if you're looking to have a certain experience in the U.S., you know, again, be sure that, uh, that you consider those factors. It may not seem like a big deal. Um, but some of you, uh, again, culturally speaking, you may just be a city person. That's fine. You may want a more intimate environment outside of the law school. You may want access to a city but not be in the middle of a city. Um, those are all things that are valid. And again, uh, the, the more comfortable you are with your, with your LLM choice, the more likely you are to have a successful experience, to be focused, um, and, to, and to leave with the type of experience that you, uh, you intended upon your arrival. I think I spoke long enough. I don't want to put anybody to sleep here. So um, uh, I will pass things along to uh, Do you think this works? Well, I'm going to stand so I can see all of you. I'm not that tall when I'm sitting. I'm Jennifer Marr. I'm from Duke University School of Law. Duke, uh, Carrie reminds me, we need to tell you about this huge country of ours and where we're coming from. So Duke is in the southern state of North Carolina, oddly enough, but there's also a South Carolina, so that's why it's north. It's on the east coast. It is in a city that is vibrant, that is uh, full of really interesting artistic and entrepreneurial people because it surrounds the research headquarters of a lot of great corporations. And it, if you like, sunshine, long falls, long springs, uh, being outside in the winter, then Duke might be the right place for you. Uh, I'm going to try to use my slides. And I think I was billed a little bit as, as the technical uh, guru here. But I'm not going to be technical. Because actually, you're going to have to do the work yourself to figure out what each school wants. How many of you have taken legal writing in law school? OK. Some in the back. This is a course that is uh, required by the New York Bar and taught at most of our LLM programs, and it's in fact a course that I taught for many years. So my biggest goal in teaching it was to try to get students to think about one main thing, to know their audience and think about how to convey to their audience the information the audience needed to know. So it's usually your client. Who's your client when you're applying to law school? It's us, the admissions officers. So what do we need to know about you? That's why I said get inside the mind of. We get more applications than we can accept at our programs. We cannot take everybody. We have to limit the class. Meanwhile, you all will probably be using the Law School Admission Council application method. Are you familiar with LSAC? So for those of you who are not, go online, lsac.org. This is a gathering uh, organization that will process your papers for a fee. 
will allow you to register for up to five years. Your registration is good, so if you're early, you can still get on. Two? Two? Who told me five? Sorry. Uh, and and uh, you, um, it will collect and evaluate, if you choose that, your academic transcripts, your letters of reference, your test scores, and then disseminate them to the schools that you decide to apply to. But what does that do for us schools? You may be applying to a whole bunch of schools that you're not all that interested in. So that's part of our wondering. <coughs> the big question, are we going to make a match? So this is not dating, uh, but it is something that all of our schools have a character, and we want to enroll the students that have are going to be happy there and have a good fit. So when I'm looking at an application, there's one question I always ask. Is this student going to have success? And success comes in many forms. You'll find these images if you want on our website. Uh, but a student who saw, talks about the academic stimulation. And a student who talks about life in America. This guy got himself a Mustang convertible and uh, that was a really great part of his year. Or a student who talks about how the career services helped her find the position that she wanted uh, back home in her country. This is also important to me. I want to have the faculty call me up as they do or see me in the hall and say, I love the LLM students in my negotiation class because they bring so much to the table. And this was mentioned before. You are actually educating the American students and everyone in the classroom with your active participation. And then finally, a lifelong career of somebody who stays connected with his friends, the former Swiss ambassador who uh, is so tight with his little class from way back when that they visit each other all the time, and that you also heard about. So here, we're, how do we figure this out? Are we tea readers, tea leaf readers? Uh, no. <coughs> we're relying on you to give us the information that we need. So first of all, What's your English ability like? I think it will be strong among all of you in this room. But you need, when you go to class, you need to have read maybe hundreds of pages in dense legal text. You need to listen not only to the professor, but your classmates who are going to be answering in all sorts of frustrating American accents and colloquialisms. Mm -hmm. You need to speak yourself. You need to have the courage to, uh, to, to learn that skill of debate and confidence on your feet, because that's so helpful for your future career. And finally, most of exams and most grading is done on written work. So you have to have the complete spectrum of English ability, and that's one thing that we, we look at. Also, your academic record. Now, the professionals in this room are people who know your education system. We know ours, but we know yours is different. So don't panic about your academic record if your uh, university is one known for strict grading, nobody gets above a certain score. We probably know that. You can also remind us of that in your personal statement. What we're looking for is uh, improvement, perhaps, interesting courses. We're looking for the, the indicia that you will succeed among top-level American JD students because at most schools, that's who you will be in class with. We're also going to look for work experience. But again, don't panic if you feel that you don't have it. Because we know as professionals that different countries have different patterns. So in some countries, young lawyers come after five or so years to, to do an LLM supported by their law firm. In other countries, young students who've just finished come to do the LLM before, before they get their first job. But if you've had any sort of internship experience, it's really helpful to know about that. And I would urge you, if you have that opportunity, to take advantage of it. Because there you'll start to figure out, wait a minute, what, why am I learning these things about law? It's because they really matter in a practical <coughs> scope. And that makes you a better student in the kinds of classrooms that we have in the United States. Uh, This is why smarter people like Sylvia don't use PowerPoint. Okay. We will require letters of reference. 
this again may, may be a somewhat uh, frightening idea if you have been in large classrooms where your professors don't really know you. A good letter of reference is going to tell me your academic ability, again, if it's from a professor, and tell me something about your personality to the extent the professor knows it. If the professor does not know your personality, again, don't panic. We're all used to the different types of letters of reference that are written. In the US, when I'm asked, it will take me a couple of hours. I will not show it to the student. I get the student's <laughs> resume, and I think long and hard about very specific details that I know about that student that conveys exactly what that student will offer to exactly the place it's applying to. You may not have that luxury. You don't have to confine yourself, most, in most schools, only to academic references. So again, if you've had some work experience and somebody who supervised you and can talk about what your work, work ethic was like, what your personality was like, this is helpful. Uh, a, a question, yes. Sorry. Go ahead. It's about the letter of reference. Yes. I'm applying to different schools. Do mm -hmm. I need to ask every time? to address to the different schools, or can I just upload a general one on the LSEC and then... You can, you can upload a general one. Uh, I need to stall them all the time, like, hey, did you do my letter of reference or not? It's yes, so, I mean, you, you, uh, this is a practical question. How much can you ask a busy professional to take mm -hmm. time out of his or her life and write for you? And so you want to present them uh, the information that they need to write a good letter, and... Uh, I would say I love it when I get a letter that says Duke, but that letter is usually coming from somebody who knows Duke and goes out of their way to write about a specific, a specific person. So a general one that, that goes through the LSAC assembly service and gets sent to all the schools is okay. You, you've got to be practical about this, so good question. Okay. Done it again. <laughs> so we're working down here. Finally. Uh, the personal statement. So again, <laughs> this causes panic. How do you talk about yourself? Americans are, are more used to that. It might look like boasting. But, you know, hey, we've all got to get ahead, so we're going to talk about ourselves. But again, in my head, what do I need to know about <coughs> you? Well, I need to know that you've thought about why you're doing an LLM, that you've thought about where you're applying and why that school, as Carrie said, is a good match for you. And there, there's no one way to do this, but you need to expose a lot of information about yourself that's relevant. So go ahead and tell us about your academic background. Tell us about your uh, activities that you've engaged in, things that were important to you, things that inspired you, what your goals are in the future, but also, Tell us what professors that you hope, you hope to study with at our individual schools. So here, you cannot write just one personal statement. Or if you do, it may look pretty bland. I've read a lot of them. Dear so-and-so, I want to go to your school because your school is a very good school and I want to study with your professors. You know, this is not helping me. This is not helping me decide whether you're the match and it's also not helping me do my due diligence as an admissions officer because I will call the academic affairs office as soon as I start reading applications and say, hello, is Professor Cox going to be on leave next year? Because that would be very bad for this particular student who wants to work specifically with that professor. And then I would sell, tell the applicant, I do, you need to know this. You, know, you may be acceptable, but it's up to you, but you need to know that this professor may or may not be here, or this class that you've identified actually is not open to LLMs. That's rarely the case at, at Duke, but it, and there are about five classes. There's one with uh, Justice Alito. He chooses his own students. He's on the Supreme Court, so he does whatever he wants. Uh, and he, he's the one exception to having LLMs in class. But again, the more you tell me at that specific level, the better I can decide whether you are a good fit for the school and will be that successful, happy face that I want to see. Yeah. Okay, so how's the application review? Uh, okay, the first thing that you, that you need to take away is that you need to know each school's application review process. 
And since I don't know them all, I, I have some examples from Duke, but caveat, this is not necessarily the case for everyone. <clears throat> so every component of the application is looked at really closely at Duke. I suspect that's the case for all of our colleagues. And the resume is, we ask for a resume. What's a resume? In the US, it's one page. It doesn't matter how much you've done, maybe two if you've really been practicing for a long time. Why? This is just a really quick reference. It's very helpful. Don't get hung up on the format if you are unfamiliar with that kind of resume, but if you can produce one, that's helpful to just get a, a first look at who is this student, where have they studied, what have they done. We look at this, the official scores from the TOEFL or the um, IOCS, uh, and I would look at the components of it to make sure that you've got the speaking, writing, listening, and uh, the fourth one, reading. Yeah, reading. Um, your academic record, as I said before, but with knowledge of what it will look like from different countries, from different universities. Your work or internship experience, so again, you don't have to have a postgraduate work. Letters of reference, which we've covered, the personal statement, uh, and a Skype interview with many people, if we can connect that way, is a very good way to have a back and forth questions and answers. So this is not necessarily exactly what all of the college student schools will be doing. You can find online the specific, uh, the specific ways they go about it. But this is a this is pretty representative, tentative, I think. For for <coughs> me, there's no one factor that is like that's it. You didn't get a hundred on the TOEFL, forget it. No, I will look at everything, and maybe there's some compensation. Uh, that makes up for what might look like a deficiency. And I, I think that's uh, also the case with everybody here. A flexibility, uh, again, looking for the math. So where am I? Uh, a few frequently asked questions, although you'll have a chance to ask them more later. Uh, but these I hear a lot. Uh, the, do I have to have the transcript authentication and evaluation service? My answer is from Duke, no you don't, but the answer from other schools may be different. Make sure that you understand that. Another one, absolute minimum TOEFL score. Again, my answer is not at Duke, although you saw and heard how important the English ability is. But check with other schools. Do I have to take the LSAT? Who knows what that is? Now, that's a standardized test that Americans or people applying to the three-year JD program have to take. But it's not relevant for the LLM, in our opinion, because you've already studied law. So we don't need to know whether you have the kind of logical ability that allows you to study law. You've already studied law. So no, you don't have to take that exam. Forget it if you, if you think you do. Um, some people have submitted grades from US exchange programs that they've been on, or summer institutes. Those are helpful, especially if, if they're graded and evaluated in the same way as the American students, that gives me a really good heads up on what you're going to be like as a student <coughs> with American students and in the Duke LLM. And a few more before we run out of time. What if I don't have any extracurricular activities? You know, Americans are all about sports and all of these things. Hey, you all have extracurricular activities. I know you do. Uh, so you will have something relevant to tell me. And it will give me a clue that may be the spark to say, yes, this is exactly the place for this person. Because I know that previous LLMs have joined the Duke Choir and sung uh, and had a great time. And if this student likes to sing, that's a possibility. How early should I apply? So the admission cycle generally has opened and generally has a deadline sometime in January. but. It may differ at different schools. It's better for you to apply early because it gives you uh, some fresh eyes. Believe me, uh, January 20th, which is the deadline, although flexible for Duke, because that's our approach, is flexibility. January 20th, my eyes are a little tired from reading applications. Uh, so you do have a bit of an advantage to get in front of the admissions officers early. And you may inquire, some schools have early admissions or 
rolling admissions where they will actually give you an answer early, which is a very nice thing to have. Um, so as early as you're able. Is there a format for the personal statement? So I hear, no, please show me the example of the perfect personal statement. Ah, imagine how bored we'd be if we had to read the same perfect personal statement. So don't worry about the format, but worry about the content revealing who you are and revealing why this particular law school is one that is of interest of you, to you. Uh, and I can tell you another funny story about <coughs> that. Don't think that you can just go through and change the name of the school, or if you do, be very careful that you actually do change the name of the school <laughs> through the entire document. We have somebody in our class who failed to do that, but my Skype, I said, you know, I have one more question for you, and she turned bright red, and I said, you know, you realize what the last sentence of your personal statement said, which was why I want to go to name of other school. <laughs> and uh, she, she said to, everything's fine. She will be a great lawyer because she'll always review a document really closely <laughs> from now on. So, so again, take some time with that. No format, but insights, very important. Anything else? We're going to have questions at the end. So good luck, uh, especially to those of you who are applying this year and those of you who are applying in the future. Do your research and write a great application so we're all really excited about accepting you. Thanks. Hey everyone, I'm going to stand up as well. I'm Holly Lawson from the University of Virginia Law School in Charlottesville. I'm delighted to be here tonight. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the elephant in the room. How are you going to pay for this? Um, funding your LLM. Um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on Fulbright because Nathan will talk to you about that. Um, but I want to um, just kind of go over a sense and then I'll talk in a minute about the bar exam and sort of some things to think about um, as you're thinking about your LLM um, and whether or not you want to take the bar, whether it makes sense for your career. So with respect to funding, some of the considerations that you want to take in mind, you're going to see the tuition and fees at all of our schools. Don't see that number and just think, oh my gosh, there's no way I could ever afford it, because you, it, you can't afford it, and I'm going to tell you how. Um, there are living expenses, so the cost of living um, in the U.S. in different cities is drastically different in bigger cities and smaller cities. So take that into account. All of the law schools publish a um, living expense. Um, budget for the year so you can kind of have a sense of okay it's going to cost me this much money if I stay in this city but if I go to this city it's going to be another ten thousand dollars more because it's much more expensive to live there so think about um, how much it's actually going to cost for you to live and the, the, the living expenses budget is broken down into housing so are you going to live on campus can you live off campus for um, inexpensive or is it more expensive to live off campus than on um, transportation do you have to have a car can you ride the buses for free? Um, do you have to pay for public transportation? So factor that into your budget as well. Um, law school books and laptops are also um, a cost. The, the law school books you can sometimes get cheaper um, through either public interest association, law association um, sales that are used books. Um, but they are expensive and most schools publish a realistic budget for what you should account for. Um, over the course of the year. And then all schools will have some sort of mandatory health insurance. Um, again, um, um, with Fulbright, there, there's a little bit of a difference, so I won't go into that as much. But just think about these things as you're preparing for your year, because the, the amount that it's going to cost you to live is going to vary from city to city and from place to place. And so you might not need as much money in, in, in certain locations as others. So think about how much it's actually going to cost for you to live. Um, in terms of funding sources, um, of course there's the Fulbright, um, and pay attention to the application deadlines for that because sometimes it, here it's December 1st, um, and, and sometimes it's before maybe you'll have your application deadline for your particular school. So maybe it's actually before you can apply to the schools, you've got to apply for these different funding sources. Um, there are third party organizations. Um, one example here in Belgium is the Belgian American Educational Foundation. They sponsor students. We've had a couple of students who've gotten um, scholarships and sponsorships through that organization. Um, loans here, I understand, are difficult to get, private loans. There is um, the Fernand Lazard Foundation um, that can give you an interest-free loan for educational purposes. 
Um, and then finally, the biggest one, and the reason that I said not to panic when you see the number, is that all of our universities and law schools offer scholarships. So have the conversation with us. Don't be ashamed. You know, if you if you, you feel like you can't afford it or you, you don't have the money, talk to us. We're here to help you, and, and we are your partners in this, and we're trying to, to make it work for you. So we, we want to know, okay, you've applied for these different fundings, and you, need, you realistically need this much money to come here. Okay, that helps us to be able to say, okay, we have X amount of money in our budget, so we're going to allocate our resources to the most students in the best way that we can help the most students to be able to study at our university. So don't be ashamed to ask. Don't be ashamed to have that conversation because we expect it and we want to help you and that's what we're all here to do, to help you. Um, so moving on to the bar exam. Do you take the bar exam or not? Um, and that's a question that I think you need to give a lot of thought before you start your LLM program. Um, as Curry mentioned, there is no national license to practice in the U.S. It's a state-by-state -state, um, determination. Most foreign-trained lawyers take the New York Bar, so I'm going to spend most of my time talking about the New York Bar. Um, they have, in recent years, put in some, some requirements um, that for courses that you have to take if you're a foreign-educated lawyer. Um, at UVA, what we did was we, we um, anytime we have a new course offering, we will run it by the Court of Appeals. I think a lot of schools do this, so that we can tell you. We, we, we ask you early on, are you planning to take the New York Bar, or do you want to take the courses to qualify you to take the New York Bar? And you say yes. So we say, OK, you're going to have to take these certain courses. You can take them first semester or second semester, but you've got to take them at some point in your, over the course of your career. So think about these things as if you're kind of planning your academics. So we work very closely with you. I have students who um, will decide no, they don't want to take the bar, and then they think, have, you know, before spring course in Rome, they well, maybe I should take, you know, maybe I should, maybe I should take, you know, these two courses that I need to, to, to sit for the bar. So, we um, can also have that that conversation with you as well. Um, but ask, you know, ask your employers, ask ask other alums, ask, you know, use the resources, um, ask us to put you in touch with alums. You know, some employers think it's very important to take the the bar, but I think more. <laughs> Do not, and so it, it 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 adds a different credential, and it adds you know it's certainly a, a um, credential worth pursuing, but it might not ne be necessary for all employers, and for certainly for those of you who might practice in the U.S. during OPT, um, right after your graduation, you might not need the bar. They might would rather you prefer they the law firms might prefer that you work over the course of the summer as opposed to study for the bar because they're not interested <coughs> in the long term. Um, you're not going to be sort of the, the, the New York expert um, in their in their law firm. So it varies by employer, and I would say talk to as many people as you can, and certainly talk to us um, if you have questions about that. I have actually a Belgian student who was deciding whether or not to take the bar. He's focusing on antitrust, and he decided that he would actually be more marketable if he didn't take the bar because he could focus mm -hmm. completely, take all of his courses in antitrust and um, competition law. And so that's just an example of how you can you know you can create your courses whether or not you want to take the, the bar um, and, and really design your own academics as, as how you, what works best for you personally <coughs> and professionally. Um, so with that, um, I will turn it over to you. Thank you all so much for having me and I look forward to meeting you later. Hello everybody, thank you again so much for coming. Um, my name is Nathan Hoffman and I'm from the, the Commission um, for Educational Exchange, the Fulbright Commission as well. As Eric mentioned at the beginning of the evening, um, we do have two big roles. One of them is to organize education fairs like this, to do outreach at universities and <coughs> schools all over Belgium, and to do um, advising in our office and on our website for students interested in studying in the US. Um, but my part of this presentation will be talking about the Fulbright grant opportunities available to you as potential LLM <coughs> students in the US. So the Fulbright program was begun in 1946. Um, on the initiative of Senator J. William Fulbright. Um, the initial idea was to increase mutual understandings between the people of the United States and people of other countries. Belgium was one of the very first countries to be involved in these exchanges, beginning in 1948. And today, the program has grown to include over 150 countries around the world, and about 8,000 students and academics and professionals go on Fulbright exchanges every year. Um, in Belgium alone, we've had about 4,000 exchanges since the inception of the program. 
You might be wondering who can apply. Well, obviously students to LLM programs, of course, but we have categories as well for researchers, <coughs> for lecturers, for journalists, language teaching assistants of Dutch and French, as well as secondary school teachers of English. Of course, today I'll be focusing on the student awards. For the student application, it is a little bit involved. We definitely recommend starting as far in advance as possible. Right now, we're about one month before our deadline. So if you have not started, and you want to go and do an LLM in the US next fall, and are interested in Fulbright, definitely start on that application as soon as possible. It's about 12 pages <coughs> online. Um, it's all completely done online. You can access it through our website. You should not mail us or email us anything. But to this website, you'll upload a resume. We say Americanized, so make sure that you do look up some formats of an American resume. It should be about one page. Um, you should have your transcripts from your most recent degree, so as recently um, as possible, up to the deadline, here are the grades that you've gotten at that point in the degree you're working on or in the degree you just finished. Um, we also need, uh, well, you can, if you'd like, upload test scores. It's not required. If you have not taken your test before the Fulbright deadline, um, it's okay. If you have taken them, you can tell us what scores you got on those tests. Then we also need two essays, a study and research objectives essay, where we talk about why you want to do this degree, what experiences you, you have that it particularly prepares you for the specific degree you'd like to pursue, as well as a personal statement where you talk about your personal development, what's inspired this passion, a formative moment in your life perhaps that is now driving you towards uh, going to the U.S. or to a particular career, career field um, or academic field. And that is a, very similar to the kind of personal statement you would write for any of these law schools. And you also need three recommendation letters from current or former professors, as well as professional supervisors. Um, the advice um, given, given by my colleague here um, definitely applies in the situation as well. Make sure they know you well, give them your CV, ask them far in advance, um, and follow up with them to make sure they've uploaded the recommendations to the, to the Fulbright application. And then finally, a university acceptance letter. So this is the one component we do not need by that December 1st deadline. We understand that you will likely not have applied and definitely won't have received a response from um, almost any law school in the U.S. by December 1st. That's completely okay. Your Fulbright application is judged on the components above this bottom bullet point here. Um, it's, it's based on your past experiences and on the quality of your, of your personal statements. Um, and not on which programs you're applying for or which programs you've been accepted to. As long as you're accepted to some accredited university program, in the US, you will receive that grant money if you're accepted for the Fulbright grant. Um, so you can send that letter to us in May, March or April or May, whenever you receive it, and decide on which program you'd like to pursue. So the benefits of the of Fulbright include uh, a grant, of course, the money, up to $30,000. The average for students is about $15,000, so it can be sometimes $20,000 as well. Sickness and accident insurance is also included. Uh, we sponsor your visa as a J-1 visa. You can get discounts on Brussels Airlines tickets. Um, and we also have in-country programming. And this in-country programming is um, some of the most exciting part of the Fulbright program for grantees. Uh, when you get to the US, you're oftentimes invited to a gateway orientation. We spend about a week with Fulbright grantees from around the world. You learn about life in the US. Um, you do some team building activities. Uh, you, it sounds like people have a lot of fun on this. It's a fully funded week or so of activities um, at a university in the US, usually different from the one where you'll be studying. <coughs> And you may also be invited for an enrichment seminar sometime during the year, similar format, about a week long with Fulbright grantees from around the world, but focused on a particular topic. And then finally, after your Fulbright grant period, you have access to the prestigious title, which is internationally renowned um, for being one of, the, one of the premier exchange programs in the world. So it definitely look good, looks good on a resume for employers. And the alumni network. Here in Belgium, the alumni network is, is pretty active. We have events about once a month, and it's a great way of meeting people, both within your professional field, as well as outside of it, people who've had similar experiences to you. To be eligible for our Fulbright grants, you should have Belgian or Luxembourgish citizenship. As Erica mentioned at the beginning, if you're a citizen of a different country, you likely have a Fulbright program available in your country. It's in over 150 countries around the world. You'll just apply through their office. We'll have some different requirements from us. Um, uh, but if you're a Belgian or Luxembourgish citizen, it will go through our office. Uh, we expect English proficiency, not based on a test score, but just based on your application materials and the English you present in those, as well as in an interview if you are invited for one. Um, you should have a minimum of a bachelor's degree. Most of our applicants do at least have a master's degree, but if you have a bachelor's, you are eligible. 
Academic excellence is usually expected, um, either a distinction every year or a grand distinction in the last year of study. And um, if your grades are a little bit lower than this, we still recommend applying. You may still be eligible if your other application components are especially strong. And then finally, that admissions letter to the US program at some point. Um, a few conditions. You can't have had a J-1 visa um, in the past couple of years, and the student has got a scholar category. The selection panel also looks for ambassadorial qualities, a willingness to engage with the community in the US during your time there, not just focus on the academic program, but get involved in the community, student life, and American, uh, American experience. And then when you come back to Belgium or to your home country, to um, engage with the community there and share your experiences and um, help improve the community here. And then uh, finally, another condition is with a Fulbright grant, once you complete the program, the academic program, you must come back to Belgium before you can work in the U.S. So if you want to do an LLM in the U.S. and then work right away, that is not possible with Fulbright. If you do not have a Fulbright grant, um, it's, there's more possibility. So with Fulbright, you must come back to Belgium for at least two years before you can apply for a work visa to the U.S. So as I said, the deadline is December 1st. Uh, January 26th is our interview date. If you're invited for an interview and you're applying to do an LLM program, your interview will be on January 26th in the Royal Library, very close to here. And we'll notify you of acceptance um, in February or possibly early March. Um, I'd like to mention our law firm partners that uh, provide special, special grants. Uh, most of our funding comes from the Belgian and American governments, but we do receive some funding from these law firms here to fund LLM experiences in the US. And then we also have partnerships with a number of US law schools. Um, although Fulbright grants are eligible for any of the over 150 LLM programs in the US, you may apply to any of them. Many of these law schools have agreed to match Fulbright grants by giving you additional money on top of the Fulbright grant. And here's a list of those that have told us specifically that if you receive a grant from Fulbright, they will give you this additional scholarship automatically. Um, many that are not listed here will also give you scholarships, um, though they have not given us a precise number. But just know that if you apply to any of these, you will get this automatic um, addition. If you apply to other law schools, they may also give you additional scholarships if you're a Fulbright grantee. Um, this is a really quick preview as I wrap up of the application. As I said, it's all online. This is what it looks like. Um, definitely recommend going to our website, fulbright.be, which I'll post in just a moment, because we have blog posts from current grantees and past grantees, and we have all the possible information you would need for the application, describing it in great detail. We also have a YouTube channel with over 700 videos from past grantees, um, as well as admissions officers talking about what they look for in applicants. Um, here is just a preview of some of the other Fulbright offices in Europe, um, and there's many others around the world. I recommend just Googling Fulbright and your country of citizenship if you are a citizen of a country besides Belgium or Luxembourg. And then finally, our website at the bottom here, fulbright.be. If you have any questions about, um, about Fulbright and applying, and you're applying to be a, a student in the US, you can email me at students at fulbright.be, and I'm happy to respond to any of your questions then. But I think we have some time, I hope, for a few questions before we move on to the fair part of the evening. And so if anyone has questions for any of us, now is the time to ask them. And we'll keep the questions generic. So if it's about a particular situation, then you can ask, of course, the representatives uh, at their table who's, uh, in a few minutes. But if there's some generic questions that you would like answered, then we'll go ahead and uh, and do that right now. Does anyone have any questions? I know it's always difficult to ask them first. So, uh, can you reapply for Fulbright? Reapply? Yes. Yes. You can. You can apply again the next year if you're not, if you're not accepted one year. Yes. I have a question about the conditions to apply for Fulbright. Okay. Um, the condition of not having a J1 visa. Please, to apply if we might exchange. It only if it's in the student or scholar category. So you should look on your J1 visa and see what words are on it. Yeah, okay. For that, if it was an internship or a short term exchange program, then you are still eligible. Right. Other questions for perhaps the uh, folks? Uh, yeah. um, I was wondering if any university to the LM program uh, offer a residency, or is it just the JD program? A residency, meaning um, like a discount if you're a resident yeah. of the state, do you mean? Mm -hmm. uh, like in state tuition? 
We have, so uh, we're, University of Virginia is a state school, um, so we do have a different tuition rate for residents of Virginia, um, which is about $3,000 less than what out-of-state tuition is. Kari, do you? It's the same. It's the same yeah. thing we're seeing this um, so, so I was. I think really, it's only you have to be a resident of that particular state, and there, um, at least in our school, there's a university office that handles and determines who qualifies as a resident. So, um, that's probably true at any state school. So that's illustrating one difference between universities in the United States. There are public ones that are supported by the individual states in which they're located, and then there are private ones like Columbia and Duke which are not supported by the state in which we're located. The thing that to know is that in the United States, both these categories are great universities. So there's not like public university and then there are the private ones because you couldn't get into public. No, that's not the way it works in the United States. But uh, it is true that there is one differentiation in tuition for in-state residents uh, going to state-sponsored universities. 